wanted to open the session on behalf of the Dallas Startup Week team. Um, they wanted to say thank you for coming and um, to thank the sponsors who helped make Startup Week happen. And of course, at the top level is Chase. We appreciate what they've done, as well as this is Chase Base Camp that we're in. Um, and Downtown Dallas, Vila Wood, Touch Titans, Dev Mountain, Circles, and Kratos. Um, and we also want to thank 1700 Pacific with providing this awesome space. This is going to be a great session, so I'm glad you're here. All uh, right, thanks, thanks, Fiona. And for anyone who doesn't know yet, this is Fiona Schachter. She runs the show uh, in the, the healthcare track. Uh, one of the many volunteers that make this happen, and also my partner in crime at Health Wildcatters. So I'm. Oh, uh, there, there's Robert. Yep. Okay, well, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the Sequence in Health Systems Innovation panel. And uh, we've got 45 minutes to pry the information out of these three distinguished panelists. Uh, but first, let me introduce, uh, introduce him from my, my far left over here, Dr. Carl Crouch. He is uh, Vice President of Innovation at Baylor Scott & White. He was previously the president of the Baylor Quality Alliance, which he built that employed uh, a 600, over 600 physicians and had another 1,800 independent physicians. Before that, he was president of healthcare improvement at BHCS, and then the founding director and 13-year chairman of the Board of Health Texas Provider Network. Uh, he's a family physician, uh, he's board certified in, in family medicine, and an AOA graduate of the Florida Medical School, trained at Parkland here, and also holds a master's in medical management from Tulane. And he wrote a book that was such an easy title that I should remember, Accountable. Accountable. So he'll tell us some about it. Um, then next, next to him is Sean Lovelady with Children's uh, Hospital System here. And Sean is Senior Director, uh, Strategic Development and Innovative Health Solutions. He was previously uh, Vice President of Development and Management Services at CDI in Minneapolis. That's a nationwide imaging services provider. Uh, prior to that, we was with Alliance Health Service, Healthcare Services, Tenet, and a healthcare consultant with KPMG. He has a, a BBA and MS in accounting from Texas A&M and the Mays School of Business. And then to my left here is Dr. Patricia Nue, and she holds the record for the longest title. Uh, so I'll not fumble it. Uh, she is uh, Executive Vice President for Population Health and President of the Texas Health Population Health Education and Innovation Center. Uh, she is uh, previously comes to us from the Banner Health Network at, in Arizona where she was the CMO and uh, is, holds a bachelor's degree from Creighton University uh, School of Pharmacy and uh, MD from the University of Missouri at Columbia School of Medicine, sports certified in internal medicine. So the first thing I think I failed to say is that my name is Hubert Zajcik, and I run Health Wildcatters, which is a healthcare seed accelerator here in Dallas. So the first thing that's unusual is to have these three distinguished uh, panelists here in the same room. I was speculating whether this is the first time I imagine it is. Is this the first time that the three of you are on one panel? All right, another first for Dallas Startup Week. Unbelievable. So, uh, but the first thing I would like to do, and we'll go with ladies first here, um, just just fill us in just a tad bit on uh, what you do and what that does at THR, and uh, kind of a couple minutes on uh, what we should deduce from, from the population health part and the THREI, which was previous, the pre previous name of the center. and. Uh, let you go first. Sure. So Texas Health Resources is a um, integrated health delivery system. We started out as an acute care hospital system and over the years have acquired uh, more assets and now fully integrated. Over the last five years, we've been down the journey of moving from fee for service, the traditional hospital system services, to a more population health company. And so Hubert mentioned that Texas Health has always had a commitment to research and education. And so about almost four years ago, THR decided that 
um, we would expand to build out our research and education and put an umbrella over it in addition to pivoting from a insurance company, I'm sorry, a, a health delivery system uh, organization to a population health company. And so then the Center for Population Health was um, formed at that time. And the research, education, and now also innovation resides inside the center. So what does that really mean? Um, inside the Pop Health Center, we have all of the accountable care capabilities so that we can take on clinical and financial risk of populations of people, cohorts of individual. Traditionally, we have managed the Medicare Advantage population. Over the last few years, we've taken on commercial populations and even more Medicare. Um, so we have about 100, a little over 150,000 lives inside our accountable care organization today. So that's one vertical inside the center. The second one is community health, community benefit. How many of you have heard of Blue Zones? So Blue Zones is predominantly in Fort Worth, and that's also an initiative that uh, stemmed from the center. And the reason why it fits very well is because um, it, Blue Zones focuses more than just the physical health. It's the mental well-being, emotional, financial, and um, environmental health. And uh, I won't go into a lot of details about Blue Zones. That's a whole nother topic. But essentially, it, uh, it takes a village to do health, health improvement. And uh, Blue Zones, is, it makes the healthy choice the easy choice. And so that's the second vertical. The third one is medical education for clinicians, physicians. The third one, the fourth one is uh, research. So traditionally, we've done research in um, clinical trials, sponsor initiated research, where um, let's say Johnson and Johnson has a device and they want to test it. We do those clinical trials in our hospitals with our physicians. Um, and so, with the role, the expectation was to expand it beyond just traditional research to do more health outcomes research. There's not a lot of evidence about how to best manage populations of individuals proactively, other than uh, research that's being done around devices, medications for effectiveness. But there's not been research about what's the best way to motivate, motivate, inspire individuals to modify their behaviors. And so those are the kinds of research that we're looking to do inside the center as well. The last vertical is innovation. And innovation means a lot of different things to different people, but initially innovation was intended to look at um, new care models, new interventions, new ways of managing populations and applying the rigor of science behind these new interventions to one, either demonstrate new evidence so that we can disseminate the practices into workflows of physician and into care of individuals, and two is potentially, is there an, uh, an opportunity to monetize those innovations? And um, we have some examples of things that we've done internally, and we could talk about that in a minute. Great, thank you. All right, so that was the first note, innovation, that was the first secret. All right, Sean, next secret. <laughs> So, hello everyone, Sean Lovelady, uh, Senior Director at Children's Health. I'm glad to be here and thanks uh, uh, Hubert for in inviting us. Um, you know, for over 100 years, Children's Health has been taking care of, of children uh, in North Texas. Um, we have oh, two flagship facilities, uh, full service hospitals. We have uh, multi-specialty centers and we also have 20 primary care pediatric groups. Um, you know, when you look at children's health, someone might say that, well, you're just one piece of the pie. And, and while that is, that is so, um, we look at it as, as you know, trying to connect with families where they work, where they live, and where they play, and where they go to school. And so as we, we go through today and we talk a little bit about the things that we are looking at at children's uh, for innovations, we have focused on some specific investments that actually meet gaps within our strategic plan. Um, you can go out there and you can do a lot of different things, um, but for us, we're being very laser focused and trying to find those needs and gaps within our plan and how we address um, 
um, health and wellness per particularly. Um, as you know, um, Tricia said, you know, we're moving from a fee-for-service to a value-based world. And so in doing so, while there are care times where you need to go and, and be, a be, be taken care of in a tertiary quaternary form at Children's, um, it's really about taking care of you around your health and wellness and where you live, work, and play. Thank you. Couch. Good afternoon, Carl Couch. I'm, um, as Huber said, a family physician. My background has been in physician leadership most of the last 20 years. Um, I helped to form our accountable care organization, Baylor Scott & White Quality Alliance, which today is, I guess, probably the largest ACO in the country and led that for, for the last three years. And today we're taking care of about 450,000 patients under some sort of value-based reimbursement. Um, like Tricia, we were very focused on population health. And what does that mean? We're focused on clinically integrating what historically in most healthcare systems is a disintegrated uh, approach to care. And I often tell people, if you don't think healthcare is disintegrated, try getting three or four diseases going at the same time and see how well integrated the system really is because it, generally speaking, it's not. So we have a lot of opportunity there. Part of the work we've done in that role is to bring physicians into alliance with hospitals and to each look at the various kinds of process changes that have to be made if we're going to truly lower cost and at the same time improve quality. It's been a great journey. And I stepped down from that role back in July. I've been in a role of uh, Vice President for Innovation with a focus towards um, trying to bring innovative uh, technologies back to the Quality Alliance for Population Health, but also to our uh, primary delivery system, our hospital system as well. The, um, the uh, Digital Health Center, which is our innovation center, that, that I'm uh, part of. I'm the basically the chief medical officer of that uh, small group. is really dedicated to three different things. We're we're dedicated to finding technologies that improve patient outcomes, and that's both in the acute care setting, but also in the population health space. So technologies that can help us do that. Second, we're dedicated to trying to find technologies that can help us be more efficient and to uh, really improve efficiency. And the third focus we have is technologies around the improving the consumer's journey. Uh, con consumer, consumer interface with the healthcare system is often difficult. It's often antiquated. And uh, consumers today represent a force that is um, increasingly powerful, seeking transparency. They want to know about outcomes. They're further, they're more and more involved in decision making. And then there's the whole industry of consumer wearables and consumer self-monitoring of diseases and uh, with devices and so on. So we're trying to look at, try, trying to uh, see how we can best and um, strategically come up against all of those uh, specific consumer wishes. Um, we, we look at um, innovations uh, very specifically, and we're trying to bring a disciplined process to that. Um, We'll look at innovations and uh, ask, is this really an innovative technology or is it something that, that um, is an innovation just looking for, uh, for solutions rather than uh, problems that the innovation can specifically solve? And we focus very much on the problem side of it. We ask ourselves if it's able to achieve one of those three kinds of outcomes, that one of those three areas, uh, because those are things we really focus on. Uh, does it align with our uh, overall objectives for population health? Because we, too, are rapidly moving towards more and more value-based payment. Um, very often, you look at some of these technologies that, that emerge, and you realize that although they benefit population health uh, as a whole, there's not direct funding for that unless you're paid differently in the actual third-party payment structure of the United States. So payment for, um, for example, um, in typical fee-for-service medicine, payment for the care that occurs between visits or post-discharge is simply not funded. If we, we, if we put uh, disease management nurses and technology to play there in a pure fee-for-service environment, there's no direct funding for that. It's just an expense. 
but in value-based payment mechanisms when we can achieve those and the funding is there to do that kind of work and that kind of work has powerful effect on the ultimate in uh, the ultimate outcomes of patients dramatically reducing readmissions dramatically improving clinical outcomes and yet Historically, we've been in a world where we get paid to readmit people, and we get paid for uh, treating them again, yeah, but that day is ending really rapidly. We ask ourselves uh, if there's already a similar technology that's in play in our system. Baylor Scott & White's the largest healthcare system in Texas now, and often we are sort of surprised to find that one of our 46 hospitals has something similar that they had put to put to put in play and, and so we ask ourselves if this is redundant or an improvement or is the t is the solution uh, bringing some new um, new value and um, so those are the the things that we're about Hubert and uh, I'll give some specifics later if you want yeah great excellent thank you well um, let's um, move back to you uh, Dr. Nguyen we uh, we talk about innovation here, and there are obviously two sides to it, and the, the stuff that you're in source and, and uh, seeking solutions, and, and hopefully we have some in the room here or in the making, but also the internal side. So um, what do you guys do to inspire or cause internal innovation uh, within THR? So over the last year, we've expanded the uh, focus of innovation to be more broad, to Dr. Couch's uh, statement earlier, we're trying to solve our own everyday problems of being a highly reliable, highly safe health system. So we're breaking down all of our workflows um, from the time someone gets admitted to the system, whether it's the ambulatory or the inpatient or getting a procedure or a test done, to the time that they're discharged or dismissed from our care. And you'd be amazed how many processes exist and how many technologies and systems are in place um, from the different monitors, from blood pressure cuffs to monitoring your heart rate, your oxygenation, the IV, how much variation and variability exists and therefore um, errors happen and it doesn't become a very safe place to be when you're at your most needy, when you're sickest. And so we're breaking that down and um, internally, we've inspired a lot of people to step up with new recommendations. And if you're thinking about, well, what is it that you can do to contribute externally to even our internal processes, it's data and information. Um, Surprisingly, we have the same problem as probably Baylor Scott and White and every other health system in the country when it comes to data and they being able to do the analytics and integrating the different systems so that it, it is seamless and in real time. Because today, um, while we are data rich, we're information poor and we're not able to act on all of the information that we're actually generating at the point of care today. Um, let alone all the information that, or data that is being generated by individuals through the Fitbits and all these telemonitoring and telehealth devices. Um, I say that because that is one place that we have had internal um, individuals come with a solution to our ability to actually track, trend, and create um, predictive models on how we staff our ORs and the time spent in the OR and the risk of patients, the clinical risk of patients that enter OR, how much time they're gonna need in the OR. And so those are things that you would think that we have, would have had figured out a long time ago, but that's all new. And so it's not just our problem, but it's everywhere because we've gone out to the market to see if there's a solution to address that particular issue and it doesn't exist. And our electronic health record systems today don't have that. Our staffing um, systems don't have it. So innovation can come from different places. And we inspire um, individuals internally to step up because if they identify an opportunity that we could develop and solve our own problems and we could monetize 
our employees can actually share in over 50% of whatever we monetize over time. And so that is an expansion, but before that, um, in the Center for uh, Population Health, we've always had the opportunity for others to pitch to us um, their solutions for either if it's an idea or something they've developed that they need a partner to distribute, to test, um, to prove out. There's actually a mechanism to do that. It's not well publicized. About three years, two years ago, um, we did a pitch day and we had a lot of interest internally and we had probably over 40 pitches. And we selected three and the the top winner is actually going through the process and it actually has to do with digital health um, and having all the information in one place for individuals to manage their health. But there are many other places um, that still need new thinking to connect the dots uh, because innovation is not just about the new technology but even leveraging current technology in new ways and solving old problems with the same technology, even though it exists, it's the ability to connect those dots. Um, and so we do have that process uh, today that is not publicized. We're hoping in the next um, six to 12 months to actually put a little bit more structure around pitch day and invite external individuals to participate. Great, so this is a secret that remains a secret. Yes. What, what you're telling us, okay. So uh, not all are being revealed, but that's is good. This sounds sounds like uh, makes a lot of sense. And I remember uh, when I was interacting before you or at THREI with, with them, and, and um, Tom Franklin is a good friend of mine. He founded THREI, uh, the various efforts uh, in, in the system to, to, to get the people involved that observe the problems that often know exactly what needs to be done and get them together with the people that can actually get it done. But let's stay on that topic. Let's jump to you, Carl, on some s solutions or, 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 or new ideas that you guys are deploying, some examples of innovation within uh, Baylor, Scott & White. Sure. Uh, in the three categories that I mentioned, uh, I brought an example for each that I thought you might uh, enjoy. One is to modernize the consumer journey. We're, we're very focused on rolling out, and we'll roll out here in a couple of months, an app called HealthSource, which is really our one-stop shopping uh, app that enables patients to uh, have basically everything from a virtual clinic appointment, a real clinic appointment, health information, registration, access to insurance, and many different functions all through a single app. Correspondingly, on the efficiency side, we're gonna roll out a provider app that also has kind of everything you would want to know as a physician or nurse provider um, to interface with our system. And uh, that'll be a, uh, a private app, the uh, internal app, but it will have some of that same uh, uh, omni functionality. With respect to uh, clinical outcomes, we're doing some things that are um, kind of interesting. We just uh, are about to complete an involvement with a little company called Proteus, which makes a micro transmitter that is Im embedded uh, in, a, in pills, and you swallow it, and it actually sends a signal to, the, to a skin sensor and in turn to the cloud uh, that is useful for a very high impact and costly drugs like the hepatitis C drugs to uh, improve compliance, and it, it, there's a business case around that. But that's, that's um, and that will be, I think, uh, we'll have that in place here in the next couple of months. We're also very much like Tricia said, involved, we're, we're, we're concerned. There's so much data and so many sources of data and integrating those is such a problem that the ability to have devices, single devices that can capture multiple biologic functions at the same time on the inpatient side and even in the ambulatory space, sensor devices that can do that, but can also aggregate that data. For example, physicians, you know, we have devices that'll con collect hundreds and hundreds of blood sugar readings. Physicians don't want to see those. Uh, there's just no way they can consume that information in, in an office visit context, but 
uh, software and systems that summarize and, and uh, take that large, those large amounts of data into information are, are usually acceptable to clinicians today. And so th that's kind of a direction that I think people are looking both inpatient and outpatient is take all the noise, summarize it, get it to me in an actionable way that in my workflow I can consume that and, and uh, have positive outcomes as a result of that. And then on the internal efficiency side, um, just one little technology we're about to roll out is a, a, a texting solution, for a secure texting solution for patients. Uh, we actually first rolled it out for our nine charity clinics. Um, charity clinic patients are, you know, underserved and, and uh, uh, economically disadvantaged. And most of them don't have um, smartphones, but they have phones. And most of them will not accept a telephone call from the clinic because they assume it's a bill collector calling, but they'll accept a text. And so texting them can radically improve no-show rates at those clinics. And then the corollary is once you've established a texting relationship, we're using it for disease management. And patients will accept that as well. Uh, and it can be done in English or Spanish. And so solutions like that, we think will have a real quick win value and um, um, just a couple of examples. Yeah, great, great. Well, let's stay on the topic uh, on, on innovation. I, Children's has done a couple of investments recently, MEND and PIECES uh, that, that you guys are involved in. Can you elaborate a little bit on what you did there and kind of what, um, kind of how local startups might fit into Children's uh, strategy? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question, Hubert. Um, Children's Health is working with uh, Go Noodle and Pieces Tech um, to actually, you know, uh, evaluate and analyze and develop uh, and co-develop technologies that continue to make life better for children here in North Texas. Um, from, you know, collecting uh, social services data to predictive analytics to you know, utilizing an app for your smartphone to, to see um, um, a provider at your house. I mean, all of those particular things really revolve around our strategy for innovative investments. And I think you will see us continue to look at those things um, in a realm of how does it fill a strategic uh, a gap for us? And how are we connected with families where they work, live, and play? Uh, when it comes to uh, local startups, uh, obviously MEND is a local startup and Pieces Tech are a local startup. There's a lot of innovative minds in Dallas and sometimes I don't think people think that. They always look at San Francisco or the coast, but there are a lot of innovative minds here and we'll, we are going to continue to evaluate local opportunities, local organizations, and understand how that fits within our strategy long term um, and we believe there are a lot of companies and, and bright minds that we would still like to meet. So, so, uh, anything in particular you're looking for? I mean, we've got some friends in the room here. Um, the, you know, we, we mentioned it's, re it's really about, um, about data. Uh -huh. It's about consumers. And so about looking at a consumer in a horizontal fashion. I think one easy way to, to tell you about it is think about the credit card industry. Credit cards know all about you. Why hasn't healthcare been that way? And so we need to get to that form where if you're seeing a primary care physician, if you've seen a provider that has done a house call visit, um, if you've been admitted for sepsis, how are we taking all of that information and wrap it in, wrapping it into some form of fashion around who you are as a consumer and knowing everything about you so that from a health and wellness perspective, we're treating you where you live, where you work, and where you play, and, and you're not coming into our facility because as you, uh, you come into our facility when you are sick, we need to keep you healthy and well, especially around the value-based uh, kind of transformation. I really agree with that. And um, John, the, you know, the, but, but from the standpoint of those of you that might be you know, creating a new solution, one of the things for large healthcare systems, and we all three are large systems, um, is that that information, if it's just standalone, and we can't connect it in some way that makes a, a clinically integrated um, experience, then it's of less value to us, in, or, or 
we, you know, the, the ability to plug those things into the data structure that we've got is really important and uh, otherwise it's very hard to use. Yeah. And, and to, to kind of follow on there, um, everybody's had struggles with health, inf health information exchanges. And so, you know, from our vantage point, we've looked at, at, at what does it mean to be um, uh, interoperable between all of those items. And I, so as we continue to move down that road, that is a big challenge for all of the health systems, um, some which may need to be solved uh, by, by the own innovation uh, within our teams. So a nugget, I think, is um, if you... Secret. Well, not a secret, really a nugget. Um, <laughs> If you are, are in the technology space, IT, I'm talking about, um, to Dr. Couch's point, you should probably be talking to the big electronic health record companies, Epic, Cerner, Allscripts, Athena Health, and figure out how you're going to fit inside that ecosystem. Otherwise, when you come to one of us and say, hey, I got this new shiny IT object, we'll get, our first question is, have you integrated? How do you do it? What does it look like? But you gotta fit inside the physician's workflow. Otherwise, don't even bother. Um, but that's a nugget if you're in the IT technology space. Absolutely, that's a very good point. And I, I think, well, first of all, there's a lot more noise, background noise, than I had bargained for. That's um, no idea that all these people in the downtown buildings are just having happy hours all day long. So I'm not sure what's going on. But uh, and nevertheless, we have got the speakers here. Um, let, let's just one quick question for all of you, and then we'll open it up. And, 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 and we've got plenty more questions from my side, but I want everyone to have a chance. Really, just on the points that you've just made as far as interacting with you and what to bring. Can you get a little bit more specific on how uh, a local entrepreneur uh, would interact with you? I mean, uh, how, how do they, how would they interface? For instance, Health Walk had us as an application process. I've got open office hours. So people can get to us and ask questions. How, how would one do that? And in the VC world, it's always, the, the saying is always, well, you gotta know someone who knows someone who knows me and, and then we'll take the meeting. But, but how does that work? But, but these people are all networkers and that's their job. So um, I understand it, but with systems, it's, you know, uh, it's a little bit newer roles that you guys are playing here. You're the pioneers in, 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 in your respective systems and uh, people don't necessarily know how to get to you. And if you could give each just a soundbite on guidance on how to go about that. Well, for us, the secret, since you're here, is there's actually one person in my organization that is the filter. And her name is Mara Vecchio, V-E-C-C-H-I-O. Um, and so she's the filter from which I trust to walk through with all the different ideas and concepts and then bring it to me. And then we ha actually have an innovation cabinet that vets even further and makes go or no go decisions. So um, I'll, I'll leave you my card and uh, you could send me an email and make sure in the heading um, to say something about startup week or so that I can filter through it quickly. Otherwise it might get lost in my emails. That's the secret. We're down to secrets now. This is great. We might lock the door and keep going here. Sean? For me, and the way that I look at it from children's health perspective is, is kind of uh, multi-prong. Um, you know, from an investment side and a strategic development side, I partner with one of our innovative leaders, Julie Hall Barrow, every single day. Um, Julie has brought a lot of things to the table for children's health around school telehealth, um, um, my asthma pal. Um, so from an application, school telehealth, uh, continuing to expand those things for our organization, uh, is someone who is a key contact. Generally, whether it comes in the door to me or whether it in comes in the door to Julie, we generally touch base and talk to each other because sometimes it may not be a direct investment. It may be working with those those um, you know startups and organizations to say, like Tricia said, is it something that, that fills a strategic goal for us? 
and we want to be very respectful of the startup. You're, you're looking for capital. You're trying to, you know, rapid develop what you're doing, and and it may not be a fit for the health system at that point. But we also may be able to connect you with somebody that is looking to do that. So from my vantage point at, at Children's, it's probably two areas. It's myself um, and Julie Halbero, who is running our innovations in virtual health enterprise. Um, something about Myra. My my uh, person is Myra Hagar. <laughs> the uh, we just established this digital health office, as I indicated. We'll have a website that's coming live, and uh, you can simply contact me, and I'll put you in touch with that. Happy to do that. Uh, again, identify that's part of your uh, startup week. Um, that's as, as to who you are. I get. You know, we all get a dozen emails a day from companies we never heard of from elsewhere. Uh, just trying to uh, get our gain our attention, and so we've we've created a very formal process too for that uh, as well. We're not in we're not as concerned with uh, investment and monetization uh, at this point in our uh, journey. Uh, more about usage and adoptability, but at the same time, uh, we are open to investment and monetization as well, and have s several things that we're seriously looking at. Uh, but that's not our main focus. Um, we're also um, excited about some of the future. Um, my, my own personal goal is to continue to see health, to try to make a difference and improve health care, because it certainly uh, needs improving in many avenues. But um, I'll, I'll recommend a book to everybody in this room uh, called The Digital Doctor. Just came out, it's written by a guy named Wachter. Absolutely fantastic book that um, I think illustrates the a better big picture of technology and particularly IT um, in healthcare than anything I've read in a long time. I, I've just thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, it's a great book. And he's got a lot of optimism about the future. We, we've been in a. His point is this electronic health record journey. The last 15 years has been hard, really hard. It's been very hard for physicians and clinicians. They they hate being the typist and the data enterer. And it's caused a lot of physician dissatisfaction in the United States. But moving forward, we're, we're almost through that adoption era and the opportunity to gain real efficiencies and real workflow improvements is right on the horizon. And I'm pretty bullish about that. And, I, and the end of this book by Dr. Wachter is very bullish about it as well, so. Great, thank you. Do we? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, you guys pointed out that uh, you know the data exchange is is obviously paramount in the, in the community right now. Um, Google launched Google Health in 2008. Ultimately, folded it in 2012. It was centered around exactly that. Um, do you have any commentary on why that that sort of initiative would fail, or what was missing in that initiative that we might look out for today um, that you know might make something like that work? I'm not familiar with uh, what Google did, but remember when Microsoft, I think, had the Health Vault? Yeah. I suspect it's the same problem. It's not integrated with the care delivery team workflow. Um, that it's a standalone, and then it's up to the consumers to go out and find all their health information, get all their records from their physicians, upload it or synthesize it, and make it meaningful. And it just doesn't happen on the consumer end, because it's not connected to anything. There's no automation in there, um, and, and it's left to the consumer. And health literacy is a significant problem, and even people in healthcare are still health illiterate about how to manage their own personal health and their own personal information, because it's a lot of effort as an individual. But if it's not part of a, an ecosystem with a uh, a workflow, it just won't be successful. Thanks. Hubert, can I? Yeah. So just kind of piggyback on that really quickly. Um, it, that is, it's very key. And the data flowing from all of these different types of items, from a doctor, from a hospital, from your wearable devices, from a social services entity, has to be standardized in some form or fashion. And that is, that is the challenge. 
And so when you look at a consumer and you're trying to look at a, a consumer in a horizontal fashion, you've got to be able to create technology that allows that data to become in, synthesized, and then have some form of outcome for you. So um, I think, you know, regardless of whether you, you hear from all three of us, those are, those are the types of things that we're all looking at from a health system. Right. We, we, like Children's, just bought an interoperability solution several years ago, and it's almost fully deployed. Our 2,600 in independent physicians that are in our Quality Alliance have 70 EMRs, 70 different EMRs. And so it takes that kind of a technology just to bring in basic information, but then when you add consumer information on top of that, uh, it's, it's, it's huge. Okay. Um, my business is in the proof of concept stage and we're trying to solve patient adherence. And so can we interact with you, I, like advice and interviews about our solution before we start spending money building everything out is very important to us. So maybe it may not be you, but do you have staff that we could just meet with and interview, show the concept and you say, I think that'll work, you know, that won't work, or maybe this kind of system to help us on our product journey? Absolutely. I think that point of contact, Mara, can uh, help you connect with other clinicians and physicians in our systems as well. Me too. Same here. All right. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming out and doing this. Uh, I'm sure everybody here is very happy to hear from people in three very influential organizations like yourselves. Uh, that you represent. Uh, questions around, again, I think what everybody re recognizes is the key problem, data integration, and um, getting involved with the vendor's EMRs. To what extent can organizations like yourselves push the needle? Isn't there a responsibility from the folks who represent your organizations who sign these multi-million dollar contracts to simply say, we need these things, they must be in your tool set or we will not purchase your product. For, for specifically around data integration, both inbound and outbound, and use your collective weight to ensure that those things happen. And finally, these things are very complicated, require a, lot, a high degree of technical talent to deal with. How do you compete in retaining, in attracting and retaining technical talent when you're up against people like Google and Uber and Facebook and everybody else who needs to do data analysis? Uh, let me, I'll take the first one about um, having enough clout to, um, d to demand that the industry be able to integrate with us. There's a bigger uh, muscle in the world called the United States government and the Office of National Coordinator couldn't even get the different EMR vendors to uh, agree that they're, th they're threatening, they're threatening them with meaningful use penalties and everything, and yet still there are EMR companies that say, nope, I'm not going to integrate. Almost, it's almost over. Most of them have surrendered, but we couldn't possibly do that even with our size, and the government has had a struggle getting it done as well. But, but I think that day is ending. Most of them are now meeting the standards of interoperability. So. I, I agree with him, and uh, how many of you have heard about um, the JSON project with Apps on Fire, F-I-H-F-H-I-R? I mean, there's trying to push for more standardized language so that it allows um, startups and others to build and connect with the EMRs. But the second thing is, uh, your second question about talent. I know it's very hard and that, um, technology changes constantly. And so for us internally, we've decided that we're not gonna be a development shop, um, that we have technology individuals to manage, maintain the data, data capture and analysis, but that's what we look to externally for um, development opportunities. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, oh, so so we, yeah, we'll just have to cut it off here. Uh, all three have agreed to be available for a few more minutes uh, to uh, take your questions. We want to do just one photo of the panel, but first let's thank this panel for coming out here today.
Absolutely wonderful. Um, yeah, we'll do one photo up up here, and then logistically, just if you don't mind helping us out, we're gonna ask the panel to come outside for any follow-up, because there's another session in here in about 10 minutes. So, yeah, yeah, everyone's having fun out there. So, and there is a...